Hello and welcome. His camera has captured the lives of others across the globe. But then one picture changed his own life when, on the cover of National Geographic magazine, the world was introduced to the Afghan girl. This week on One on One, meet renowned international photographer Steve McCurry. He had a typical comfortable upbringing in the U.S. state of Pennsylvania, which developed into a fairly wild and restless lifestyle through high school and into his college years. For Steve McCurry, the crossroads came when he discovered photography and travel, realizing he could document some amazing people and places across the world. His career break came when he disguised himself and crossed into Afghanistan just before the Russian invasion in 1979, sneaking out rare award-winning pictures showing what was happening there. It was also Afghanistan that made McCurry an international star, when in 1985 he took the picture that became National Geographic's best-known cover, The Afghan Girl. Almost equally remarkable was when he returned to find her 17 years later, keeping the story alive. Steve, delighted to have a chance to chat. Great to be here. When you look at what you've done in, in the amount of years you've been working in this profession and, and so much that you've achieved, how much has photography changed from when you started those years ago and, and now? Well, I mean, the big change, obviously, is digital. Everything was film, and now it's digital. But I actually think that's a really wonderful development. I think that, and the other thing which is dramatic, the, the, the dramatic change is that uh, newspapers and magazines are on the decline, and the internet, I mean, who would have even dreamed 20 years ago uh, we'd even have an internet? But um, uh, I started off as, on a newspaper, and. Uh, the fact that many newspapers, many major newspapers, are just dropping like flies. So it's a, it's a whole new frontier. But in a way, I think that if you're smart, innovative, and are clever, you can deal with this and really actually come out better than before. There are many types of photography. Um, how do you regard the paparazzi? Do they give photographers a bad name? Oh, yeah, the paparazzi. Are, but, you know, there's a market for that. People, and maybe there's a larger market for that than you know, good hard news photographers. So um, I've never done that. Uh, I think it's really the kind of the last rung on the rung of photography. But uh, you know, that's my opinion. Now it's a common question. I know you've been asked it before, but I want to get your perspective on what makes a really good picture. I, I think the definition of a great picture is one that uh, stays with you, one that you can't forget. Uh, pictures that were, you know, I think that fill that bill are. Uh, the execution in Vietnam of Eddie Adams, which in, in some ways really changed uh, public opinion against the war. Uh, maybe the picture in Iwo Jima of uh, you know, Joe Rosenthal. Um, th this is really the, a great photograph, one that um, you so can't forget. It doesn't have to be technically good then, necessarily. No. In fact, uh, those pictures weren't technically good at all. Uh, Eddie Adams' picture is kind of grainy, it's not particularly... Uh, maybe sharp, and the composition isn't great, but the power of that picture is amazing. You shoot people, you specialize, especially in faces, and you say you have the ability to wait until the real soul shows itself. When do you know that moment? You know, I think that it's uh, instinct. I think something that you, it's kind of an intuitive feeling after 30 years of trial and error and, and probably failing more than not, you really get a sense, you hone that skill of, the right time to press the shutter when everything comes together, the background, the expression, the light, the composition. And of course a picture can give a distorted perspective too, so how do you ensure you keep the image honest to the scene? Uh, again, I think it's just a question of uh, experience, judging, evaluating the situation moment to moment, and just trying to s make a picture that's representative, that's true that's ethically honest, uh, that sort of thing. With all the things you've done, of course, you've seen pretty much everything, as we were saying, you know, but how hard is it then to find an original shot? Nowadays, how difficult is it to get something that's unique and different? You know, everything's been photographed under the sun. Every place has been picked over. So now it's sort of, everything's sort of a variation on a theme. Now you're trying to find that little wrinkle, that little twist, that nuance of, of change, but it's the world, if you look at the globe, there's really not one country or region that hasn't been explored to, you know, to the nth degree. It's very difficult to come up with something original at this point. Now, are you there to witness the world or are you there to help change it? 
I think it's both. I think we're there to witness and inform the same way that, that, that you and the news media. We want to tell these stories of people that you know don't have a voice otherwise. And through that, uh, you know, I think you know, I want to go to places that interest me personally. And I think in a place like you know, Afghanistan, I think of the world, the people, people in the, in the United States are informed and actually understand what's happening that hopefully there may be some small change might happen for the good. Now, Philadelphia is where you were born. It was your, your first home, so to speak. What do you recall of those early years there? What was it like? I, I was wild. I, was, I wasn't interested in school. I just wanted to have fun and uh, play in the woods and play football and that sort of thing. And after getting out of high school, I kind of realized that you know, I had to get a job. So after traveling in Europe for a year, uh, I said, you know, I got to go back to school. And, and somehow I got a passion for filmmaking, which in a way led me to photography. And once I picked up a still camera, I just never looked back. I just fell in love with the camera. But it was cinematography and history you studied at Penn State. Exactly. All right. Now, w w at that time, you know, when you were initially, before you got that, that, picked up that camera, what were you thinking of? What were your career choices? I was kind of lost in a way. I thought uh, maybe teaching. I had this uh, wrong, f I had this sort of fantasy I was going to be a, a history professor, a scholar, which would have been a disaster because I'm, I'm totally... I, I'm a very restless person. I want to move, uh, and, and I really work from my heart. So, um, f fortunately, I found photography and allowed me to travel. Travel and exploring the world was really my main ambition. That was really what I wanted to do with my life, and, and photography really made me, you know, just you know, satisfy that urge. Tell me about your folks. What sort of influence they had on you, and, and how they regarded your sort of lost period, and then when you found yourself. Well, I think they were perplexed and bewildered and befuddled with how, you know, wild I was and maybe disappointed. But as, as you know, when I really kind of came to my senses and realized that, you know, in this world you really have to get a job and, and work. Uh, and I did actually really well in college, so I think they were kind of felt like I'd turned that corner. What characteristics of them do you see in yourself, each one, your, your mother and your father? Well, my father was very personable. He, he had a really great disposition. He was really, you know, good with people. And uh, and I think in photography, and I think I picked up a little bit of that. I think in photography, that's really so key to getting access to the situation. When I look at colleagues in photography or in television or in the media, the, the ones that are charming and are disarming and that uh, are it, with intelligence are the ones that can really have that little bit of edge. But it, there takes a sense of humor is also kind of important in that mix of personality. Now, once you'd found yourself, so to speak, and, and picked up that camera and knew what you were doing, you actually worked, as a, 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 worked on a pet newspaper for a couple of years before you went off to India to freelance. Why India? You know, I had, um, in college, I had traveled, and I lived in Europe after high school. In college, I had traveled to Africa. Uh, in college, I went through Latin America. So when it came time to really strike out on my own as a freelancer, the only part of the world I really hadn't explored was Asia. So I thought, okay, well, India. I mean, that's like the... It, China was a little bit tricky in 1978, a little closed. So the big fish, the big, you know, big show in Asia is, is India, the India subcontinent. So that's where I went. And, and I was only going to go for two weeks. And that two weeks turned into two years. I was, I was just uh, amazed at the variety of culture, and it, it was kind of one thing led to the next: uh, Ladakh, you know, Rajasthan, uh, Pakistan. Uh, when I was in Pakistan, I ran into some Afghan refugees who invited me to come to Nuristan, and so I went from one place to the next. And before I knew it, I was. Um, in this sort of war zone in Afghanistan, thinking, you know, I'm from, uh, from the suburban of Philadelphia, and here I am in, in this war zone in Afghanistan. It, you know, I was wondering, you know, adjusting from that, uh, that sort of environment in the USA, what were the skills, do you think, that helped you adjust to such a different environment? You know, Europe is obviously a lot more like America. Well, I think uh, this wildness of my youth, I developed a lot of street smarts. And I think when you're in 
you know, the streets of, of you know, uh, Peshawar or the streets of, of Delhi uh, or, or in Kabul or dealing with these kind of, I, I think that's really helped me navigate through some of these difficult situations. When you look back on it, uh, you know, in terms of your education, what would you have done differently? I, I wanted to say I would have skipped college altogether. In fact, I may have skipped high school altogether and just gone right from sort of um, after 16, gotten a one-way ticket to Africa or Asia or somewhere and just got out. And s I think I could have saved myself 10 years by just getting out into the real world and exploring this you know, amazing planet that we live on. So very much experience on the job rather than all the academic stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, what, the, what I've learned about human nature and the world and different cultures and religions has to do with actually visiting these places. I think that's so kind of key to understanding uh, the world and, 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 and different cultures and different people. And a lot of the misunderstandings, I think, come from uh, you know, being kind of fooled by the, the, the media or somehow uh, not seeing these things for yourself. And once you actually see what it's like to be, you know, African or, or Indian or, or, you know, somebody from Brazil or Chinese, then I think you get a kind of a, uh, you can decide for yourself what's going on. I have many more questions for you, Steve. We're going to be uh, looking at some more of those iconic images that you, uh, you came up with in just a moment. There's more one-on-one -on -one with Steve McCurry when we return. Welcome back. You're watching one-on-one. -on -one. We're speaking with award-winning photographer Steve McCurry. There was a turning point in your life when you crossed over the, the Pakistan, from Pakistan across the border into Afghanistan, dressed in native clothes, and arrived there just before the Russian invasion. Tell me how you got the films out. About a dangerous time. Well, I was, after spending this time in this very kind of dangerous and I had never had an experience with working in a war zone or an area of conflict, really. So I was very nervous that when I re-entered Pakistan, actually without a passport or a visa to Afghanistan, that they would confiscate my camera and my film. So I actually uh, sewed the film, the exposure as a film, into my shawar kameez. Mm -hmm. And so that if I was uh, you know, arrested or whatever, that they might take my camera bag, but hopefully it would keep my film. And of course, the Shawal Kameez being a loose, uh, the loose Pakistani outfit that they wear, the like long shirt and, and pants, probably made it a little bit easier, I guess. Absolutely. Now, let's go to that, that one major iconic picture that has defined a lot of your work. You took a picture of that, the famous National Geographic cover um, picture of the Afghan girl, uh, Sharbat Gula. Uh, and tell me that story, how it came about, because I gather she didn't want to be photographed at first. Well, she was very shy, and I was, I was worried that if I approached her first in the school that she might refuse and then uh, would, would feel embarrassed and wouldn't allow me to photograph her. So what I did was I photographed some of her uh, fellow students uh, and they, uh, they agreed, uh, kind of creating a situation where she didn't want to feel excluded. So when I came around to her, you know, she didn't want to say no because everybody else had been photographed. But she had this uh, remarkable look and these really piercing eyes. And, um, you know, after the fact, after it became a, a, on the cover of National Geographic, that particular look really came to kind of symbolize uh, Afghans, Afghan refugees. And she had this uh, dignity about her and this uh, un kind of flinching look. And uh, I think that it was why, I mean, there were so many people that were inspired by that picture to come and volunteer in the refugee camps who uh, draw, drew inspiration in one way. I, we, we had hundreds of letters of people who had such positive, positive things to say about her and the picture and the whole story that we had done. Even people wanting to marry her. Oh, we had people who wanted to send her clothes, send her money, and men who actually wanted to uh, propose marriage to this young 12-year-old girl. Of course, they didn't know that she was 12 years old. They thought maybe she was older. But Now, of course, she, went, she didn't know that her face was there in front of hundreds of millions of people around the world. And she went back to her fairly tough life there in Afghanistan. Um, but really, things moved on. How did it change your... How did that one picture change your life? Um, after it was published in, in uh, I guess, June of 1985, and the hundreds, in fact, there were thousands of letters which 
came in right away, but they persisted year after year after year to the point that a day didn't pass, literally a day didn't pass that we didn't get a letter or a phone call and eventually emails of people wanting to use the picture for uh, textbooks, uh, you know, magazines, uh, people wanted to paint that picture. Uh, it, it was, the, 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 it was a, the, this flood of interest in that picture was just overwhelming. And then 17 years later, you went back to find her, and that was quite a challenge, wasn't it? Well, we didn't have her name, we didn't have her tribe, we didn't know what part of Afghanistan she lived in, and to find, you know, for some American uh, men to go to Afghanistan or to Peshawar looking for this female was really quite a, you know, kind of <laughs> crazy thing. But we... Uh, uh, we're fortunate enough to work with some excellent, or actually one really outstanding uh, Pakistani journalist who in fact created the situation of trust among the elders of, of, her, of, of this refugee camp. And in fact, through him, we're able to really, really find her because um, he had such a, you know, credibility in, 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 you know, among the people. What went through your mind when you saw her 17 years on? Well, I really fully expected the same girl with the same maroon shawl to walk through the door with that same look. And of course, you know, she was now uh, almost a 30-year-old woman. And uh, I was kind of shocked that, uh, because I was expecting this 12-year-old girl, but uh, I mean, we were so, I can't tell you how relieved and so happy we were to be able to finally find her and to know that she was safe, she was alive, she was well, she married, had children, because uh, we had had all sorts of reports over the years of all sorts of you know, terrible things. So we were, and then to finally be able to actually create a situation where we could uh, give back to her and, and make her life better. So it, it was, uh, you know, we were really thrilled. Afghanistan is one of the many places you've covered which have really been torn uh, I mean, literally shredded to bits. I mean, and a lot of strife and, and trouble that you've seen, death and destruction. How do you stay grounded? How do you stop it getting to you? You know, I think that you have to kind of almost look at what we do in perhaps the same way a surgeon might look at, at his work, where you're operating on people. Perhaps there's times when tragedy happens and you lose a patient, but that doctor has to kind of come back the next day or go home, and he has to find some strength or some place within himself or herself to, to go on and, and to be able to have the hope or expectation that the next day he's going to be able to, he or she is going to be able to, to do again something positive. So I think you have to have some sort of, um, uh, you detachment, know, I guess. detachment yeah. perhaps, some, yeah. Although it does affect you directly too and you, you end up with your own personal security threat and you've, I think, faced a few very challenging situations. Has there ever been a time where you really thought, my safety is really uh, at stake here? Well, in Afghanistan, my room was, uh, hotel room was broken into at 2 o'clock in the morning with uh, a man at the window with a, you know, bayonet trying to break the, you know, the window and another man at the door with an AK-47. And they, I had to let them in eventually because I didn't want to anger them and have them break the door down. And I thought that they could just shoot me at any moment and nobody would know the difference. And, and fortunately, all they did was rob me and take some few things. But uh, I was, we were under attack so often in Afghanistan, uh, different uh, battles of Jalalabad, and, and you know there were MiGs flying around, and, and mortars, and, and artillery, and small arms, and it would come in from all sides, and you just thought, you know, what, what am I doing here? <laughs> I'd almost rather be anywhere than here right now. And uh, yeah, it, it was quite a... And you even ended up in prison for a few days, five days, I think. I was arrested twice, uh, both times in Pakistan. Uh, the first time I was re-entering Pakistan from the uh, tribal area, uh, and we were picked up, and they were, what are you doing here, you know? Same thing uh, going into Afghanistan, again, picked up, questioning, uh, you know, who are you, what are you doing, are you a gun runner, are you a spy, and all this kind of stuff, and eventually they figured out we were just reporters and photographers and let us go. It's, it's always a difficult question, I know, to ask someone to pick their own favorite. But from your collection, is there one that you really consider your favorite? You know, I think that for me, my personal favorite would be a, a dust storm I uh, photographed in Rajasthan of these 
Rajasthani women huddled together uh, next to a tree with this kind of dust swirling around. And there's really a sense of kind of movement and urgency about that picture. I, I think that that's my favorite. Uh, I was wondering, the influences you had in your life, who, who were your mentors uh, over the years? Well, the, the one photographer that I think influenced me more than anyone was uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson, a French photographer who uh, was uh, the dominant force, I think, in documentary photography in the last half of the last century. Just, uh, he covered uh, India and, 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 and China and uh, all sorts of major stories. What's the single biggest lesson you've learned in life from your career? That people, wherever they are, whatever country or nationality, uh, there, there's a commonality among people. And people, wherever they are in the world, want to be respected and they want to be loved. And if you can respect people, uh, it's a wonderful world and doors open up and everything's fine. When people are disrespected, then things get ugly and things get nasty. And I think a lot of, I look around at some of the conflicts in the world and I think that's at the root of the problem. People are disrespected, people, and uh, that, that's one of, that's kind of the major thing I, I've kind of learned. And like all great artists, you get to leave behind your pictures, but how would you like to be remembered? What would you like to leave as a legacy? I think somebody who, um, uh, did what he loved and made left the world a slightly better place than before I, I, I you know, came into this world. So I think that um, uh, what I've photographed and how I photographed it with, um, you know, again, looking at people as fellow human beings with trying to give them their dignity. Uh, you know, I've just loved traveling and witnessing this amazing world that we live in, uh, because I can't think of anything more interesting than traveling and photographing and just seeing this you know, wonderful, crazy world that we live in. Steve, I wish you many more beautiful pictures. Thank you very much for your time. Nice to be here, Riz. Thank you.